Hello, everybody. Today I'm joined by Matt from Look Battle Mats. Uh, and we're going to be having a bit of a chat about who he is, who Look are, where they've come from, and hopefully plans for the future as well. Uh, so it's great to have you on the channel for the first time, Matt. No, pleased to be here, Jerry. Yeah. Uh, so before we kick into your current project with Luke, uh, I suppose people might want to know a bit about who you are and how you got into gaming. Oh, well, long time gamer, I think. Uh, how did I get into gaming? I'd have to blame Fighting Fantasy at some point in the 80s, I reckon, as the real initial spark. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, being at school and Choose Your Own Adventure books kind of moved on to um, those first couple of, like, you know, the, the classic Green Spy and Fighting Fantasy. Yeah. And I remember they, they had, like, uh, one in that series which was basically a role-play game but fighting fantasy and it had like some weird tiger cat man bursting out of a dice it's like fighting fantasy dungeons or something yeah and i remember playing that with like um, some friends at school and then we had a games workshop open up so i grew up in derby so we we're very near to uh, nottingham the uh, the heart of the relocated games workshop mm -hmm. and they opened up a branch in derby oh, it must have been mid 80s I remember like getting um, the early hours, sort of like they had a grand opening at like five in the morning and first X number of people in got a free miniature or something. Yeah. But I remember going in with my dad and queuing up at stupid o'clock for a young age back in the 80s <laughs> and uh, getting the uh, the red box. So, you know, like the, uh, the Elmore Dragon fronted um, D&D basic set. Yeah. And it was kind of from there. You spend many a day hanging around in that games workshop and uh, many a bit of free time doing role play games and war games. And that will probably confuse a lot of viewers the fact that Games Workshop used to stock things like Dungeons and Dragons, but yeah, well, uh, they, they, it was one of the used, defining traits. They, they used to publish um, yeah. a fair few things. I've, I've, yeah, I've got um, yeah a whole bunch of different role play stuff which has got Games Workshop logo on back from the day. Mm. Yeah, it, it was uh, it was how they built their brand and made their money starting with the RPGs. And and is it particularly the role playing side that you sort of gravitate towards or do you, do you sort of uh, it's what I tend more? to get more time to do. I think it's a bit easier to um do that. The amount of times I can get like a full table out and do um, a decent sized game of forty K or something is very rare at the minute. Although I've got a massive pile of grey plastic waiting to be uh, <laughs> painted at some point. I'm I'm pretty certain that that's their natural colors the natural habitat if you uh, yeah take, if you take them away from the gray they just uh they start losing games that's how i feel yeah. anyway i just narrative every game as being like a nighttime skirmish and everything's yeah. just in grayscale it's fine <laughs> so, sounds like my night goblins attacking <laughs> yeah. at night with soot covered faces and oil blackened weapons so they're just prime black then yeah yeah much. yeah um so when you decided to start look as a as a sort of venture then were you already working within the, the industry or did you just decide that this was something that you wanted to do as a as sort of a either a side project well, or a passion project we, we started off originally as um, a reseller so um right. i think it was x-wing was the game at the time so mm -hmm. about 2014 2015 sort of time mm -hmm. so lots of x-wing going on and i thought well you know i'll get an online shop going get an account with um, a distributor and start selling these because you know like uh, it was very very popular and they had the um the set releases and it would be a case of like here's the new wave here's the new ships get those and then start doing shows and things and always wanted to accessorize from there so we mainly did um mats originally for x-wing but started moving that over into war gaming and skirmish gaming and because i do probably more role playing than I do war games started doing um, role playing mats and things as well mm -hmm. uh, the one sort of main problem of course with the mats is they can be a bit of a pain to transport yes um, certainly especially the big neoprene ones that but that people seem to have gravitated towards as being the uh, the fanciest of all mats they look yeah, great but you need a drain pipe to to carry it around they are nice but yeah they're a reasonable weight and mm. <laughs> slightly annoying to move anywhere so yeah we, we started looking into ways of trying to make a more efficient thing for role plays i tended to find that um i was doing more and more maps for the game that i run mm -hmm. which is about a mile and a half walk from where i am and yeah eventually after a couple of different tests of tiles and things like that we ended up on the book format and that worked really really well yeah i mean this 
this was one that grabbed, I think, everybody's attention whenever we first saw it. Um, was just how compact and still uh, diverse a set of mats that was within it. Uh, the fact that you could have something that flipped down on the table and was more than more than large enough, depending on your style of play, um, to allow you to, to to play out your games in a, a compact space, but also not have to worry about either transporting or storing a ton of stuff and a ton of scenery. Uh, and in a very short amount of time, it seemed like the the uptake for the mat books became massive and, and it sort of expanded from there from a, a sort of a very generic fantasy base to start to cover other quarters of, of RPGs um, into the, the likes of the sci-fi and the cyberpunk. Um, how, cause how long has Luke been going now as, as the, the battle mat side? It's, it feels like you've been around forever, but it, it's also a very, very short amount of time. Um, so, the, the first map book um, had its first sort of public airing in Salute 2018, I think it was. Um, so that would have been early in the year, about April sort of time. Mm -hmm. And we, we sold all the ones that we took to Salute. Um, we then had them on the website, so just our own website. And yeah. They went reasonably well there. Then it was the expo that year that we probably got proper wider sort of like... Um, that recognition or just people sure. to see it and we did the um the awards that year we got the uh, people's choice for best uh, new accessory mm. and yeah we sold every single book we took to that um, expo and had to then get more and i think we we'd gone to kickstarter uh, mm. after the initial book um, which was to fund a larger book and a sci-fi at the time we did another larger book as well mm -hmm. So yeah, like that went from the big to the giant and then did sci-fi as well and did a new volume of fantasy at the Kickstarter level. One of the interesting things for me is apart from the the book format, because while that is infinitely repeatable in the the sort of the little big and, and giant books, and you can add more and more volumes to that over time, you haven't decided to just stick with the books and you've started to expand beyond that obviously the scenery packs is is a no-brainer having having the flat pack boards essentially with the, the books is is great having the static cling terrain to throw on those is just a, a perfect accessory for them but then you you've started to diversify from there because we we got the um i want to say perilous quest is it the, the uh, untold encounters untold the, encounters uh... yeah um because you've you've not just sat there going well we're just going to do the books but you're starting to i suppose make it a a, a more diverse array of components that will cover anything that a, a gm needs to play with uh how how much of that is just yourselves or do you do you get in artists to help you with this? Because it, you seem to be expanding now at an exponential rate. So all the map work, so the, all the uh, the battle map um, style work, that that's all me. Mm -hmm. um, so it's all in-house for what's in the map books. Uh, we use artists for our cover images. Um, we've used the same artist on a lot of things. So they all have the same sort of like fantasy comic book style. And that's mm -hmm. uh, someone called James Gray. Uh, so that's one of his dragons. And I think, what have we done? We've um, had the big books for the sort of A4 most portable size. We've had the giant books, which are the A3 going out to A2 sort of size. So like yeah. the, uh, the really big single books. Then we went to the modular books, which is a bespoke one foot square size uh, twin book set. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea being there that they're, it's all about the modularity and being able to put two of them together and they're all designed so that the designs in one book complement the designs in the other. So you can switch and change them around and yeah. have lots of different layouts. Uh, we've then moved sort of sideways a little bit from that and done the box of adventure. 
which is essentially a system agnostic starter set. Uh, so that's uh, maps, um, terrain tokens, and um, sort of character monster tokens and the like. Yeah. And then the extra bits, um, a lot of these came out of the back of the Wilderness Kickstarter, mm -hmm. uh, where we basically tried a couple of extra things. So we did the immersive GM screen, which is a double-sided backdrop, effectively. So as opposed to being like um, an action scene with, you know, like your heroes and dragons sort of set across it and all the rules on the other side, it's a um, a landscape, ex sort of like, you know, wilderness landscape on one side yeah. and a town vista on the other. And they're both by um, Andreas Roscher, um, mm. who did Th those are absolutely wonderful, gorgeous. wonderful pictures. Yeah. No, they're, they're really nice. And the, the um, nice thing about that, uh, for me, is a lot of games, some games I play to death and I don't need to look at rules and encounters for them. So just having a, a generic backdrop is great, but also just for setting up on the table so that people aren't staring at, as nice as, as, nice as the bespoke GM screens are for things like D&D, having a big dragon and a bunch of people fighting and some action scene or, you know, the inferno of, of uh, the abyssal pits of hell doesn't really make sense when people have got a mat and miniatures in front of them. But having these as almost backdrops to the game that they're playing on the tabletop, I thought was really nice. Yeah, so the idea is essentially, yeah, just like a photography sort of like um, backdrop, almost infinity yeah. zone, where if you put it around and they're, they're sized so that they, because it's a 12-inch um, a edge panel and most of our books have a 12-inch edge somewhere on mm -hmm. them. You should be able to fit it neatly along one side of the uh, the books, and sort of get the uh, the map sort of going into the distance. Was the uh, idea? Yeah. And uh, as part of that, then the cards and untold encounters were were yep. they part and parcel of that Kickstarter as well, or is this? Yeah, they they came out of the Kickstarter. They've gone into um, general release. Uh, they're either out now or coming out soon, depending mm. where in the world you are. I think. Uh, I'm not sure these, the exact fit. These blew me away, um, and I, if anybody's seen me reviewing them, uh, they'll know what I thought of this book and this card set because I think I put it like this: if you are brand new to GMing, this is a must buy. And if you've been GMing for years, this is a must buy because the amount of times where I've had a finely crafted adventure and the very first thing my group has done is just go in the opposite direction or they go, what's in there? And yeah. then you're left going, I don't know what's in there. And being able to just pull a random table from the book and go, this is what's in there, or this is the, the story hook that you find when you're in that room or whatever it happens to be, or pull a card from the encounter deck and just have something really bizarre happen, like all the terrain that the people are hiding behind for an ambush that they've spent half a session planning and the, the shrubberies and rocks get up and walk away, leaving them completely exposed and visible is just hilarious oh yeah um, and, and, and as, as a gm you get to kind of go oh but the you know the cards told me to do it so now it's happened yeah yeah and and that that i thought was fantastic because it it, it covers all the bases from i suppose story development and, and scenarios to um a bit of fog and friction uh the, the unexpected happening and even the gm may not know what's going to happen but it allows you to weave more complex stories without having to spend months sitting down and planning them out. Those are two massive, massive resources that are sort of taking you away from um, just map design, essentially. Uh, there was a ton of work went into them. Was that all uh, your own work as well? Yeah, so both the cards and um, the Harbat book, that's uh, both me and uh, Tamsin, so the, uh, the two halves of uh, Loki. Mm -hmm. um we've done the writing for both of those uh, i've done the layout for them and the arts um a mixture of a couple of different artists that we've used how long did it take you to put those together because the the the, the encounter book itself it's not just random tables which would be difficult enough to put together a thousand encounters or hooks um in and of itself but then there's also 
uh, half a dozen scenarios in there as well, generic scenarios. So uh, I don't know. <laughs> it seems like it took a long time, but uh-huh. if I look at the calendar and things, it Kickstarter was last February. Um, so if everything must have gone to print about last March, April time, because we fulfilled um, near the end of last year, and it was right. a very difficult year to fulfill in. Yeah. Um, so I mean. We'd started writing bits of it before the Kickstarter, obviously. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, so you had a, a it, bit it, of a, an idea of where you were going and how it was going to be presented, anyway. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's set up to match the. We kind of did the um, the wilderness as the the sort of the the third in a trilogy of the the main map um, two book sets. Yeah. So we had the dungeon, towns and heavens, then the wilderness. Yeah. So untold encounters is kind of structured in the same way. You don't need the map books for it at all. Hmm. Um, but it's structured as um, dungeons, towns and taverns, uh, well, town encounters, and um, wilderness. Yeah. But we've laid out different ways for setting up adventures or journeys or urban sort of um, well, uh, adventures and. <laughs> dungeon generation and layout and things like that in there. Uh, it's just lots of stuff that has come up over the years of running games that have uh, gone into a book, really. Yeah, and it's handy to have that. Like I said, it's, it's almost um, it's almost a surprise that nobody has attempted to do it before. Because when you look at it, you're thinking it's, it's such a sensible thing to have, such a, a, an accessible piece of of work that is it the book with the cards that they're not the same thing as well. I should probably point out to people, the cards are not just the book repeated. The cards are their own little set of tweaks and changes. But when you think how difficult it is to explain to somebody what a role-playing game is, and then when a, a group gets involved in role-playing for the first time, there's always that page or two at the start of a book saying role-playing game is where you and your friends sit down and start telling stories. And then essentially you're asking somebody to write a novella. Yeah. Well, you're asking one. You're asking one person. You're asking the GM to write the the broad strokes of a novella, and then his characters will then fill the, in the blanks as they play. It's not an easy thing to do. If I was to sit down and, and attempt to write uh, a story, I, you know, the first bit is twenty minutes of head scratching. Having all of those those um, tables and, and pieces in the book uh, is is just a surprise that nobody had thought to do it beforehand or was it such a an in-depth dive for yourself that you're thinking well i can see why nobody did it beforehand because it's it's a lot of work uh, it it probably turned out to be more work than we we're expecting to start with but i think that's writing anything turns out that way you think yeah. okay yeah i've got some ideas let's put it down on paper and then let's edit it let's change it let's <laughs> do all the extra bits that are needed to try and make it lay out properly and but yeah no very proud of how it's how it's turned out and it's one of those resources that I actually make use of myself just because mm. it's great just for prompting things off and kind of going like, well, what's this going to be? Let's have a bunch of uh, little uh, prompts and ideas and yeah. not, string not, them together. Not every adventure has to start in a tavern. That's, no, that's all we're no. saying. <laughs> uh, uh, although taverns are still fully valid, I'm well, sure. You know, yeah, you can always get a drink. With obviously the, the I suppose, I don't want to say the core of Luke, but obviously there's a, a very fantasy heavy leaning with what you currently have map wise and now with the, the books and the cards as well. But with having the sci-fi and the cyberpunk side and teaming up with, um, oh. Oh, uh, Talisorin. Talisorin, yes, for uh, cyberpunk. I was going to say 2020 because that's the copy on the shelf behind me, but it's not anymore. It's 2077. Cy- cyberpunk Red. Uh, that's it, yep. Yeah. Would you see yourself dipping into those genres in the future to do something similar to the the Encounters book, or uh, because because they've got the the cyberpunk side, it, it may not be as necessary for it, but the the sci fi generic sort of uh, side of it. Potentially, I mean, with sci fi, it's so wide ranging. Hmm. So yeah, like um, anywhere between you know, your space opera, your gothic sort of space horror, um, through to all sorts of like super hard sci fi. You- you might have to, I'm not sure, you might have to either be too generic or too specific, and it mm-hmm. might get a little bit tricky to do um, a one-fits-all. It's a bit easier for fantasy because they're all 
the same tech level, generally yeah. speaking, and magic you can use or not use depending mm. on your setting and the like. Uh, but, but, but potentially, I mean, we've we've done, as you say, the um, sci-fi big and giant books. We did the cyberpunk big and giant. Uh, we've not done a two book set for um, a science fiction setting yet. Mm-hmm. Um, partially because the science fiction market is smaller. Uh, yeah. there, there, there's less people playing sci-fi MRPGs. So it's trickier to try and get a product out for that. Um, and you also run into that. What style do you use without mm-hmm alienating you know pun intended yeah. different elements of the sci-fi market to try and focus on one uh we did do um a big digital kickstarter at the end of last year to try and sort of celebrate all things sci-fi mm-hmm. um for that one it was all map work from us so it was a big collection of um tiles and tokens for making your own maps i think it ended up being a hundred and something maps so, you know like ships and spacescapes and all manner of other stuff and we commissioned a starfinder adventure so there was some uh, written material for people to go through and that was from mm. Stephen hart yeah that, well that was the the next thing then the um the virtual tabletops obviously over the past couple of years people have been getting involved in that in a, a big way because they had no other choice but you've got things like foundry and um roll 20 and dnd beyond and that sort of thing and you have some digital assets, the likes of the maps and and that sort of thing that are available. Do you, do you see yourself doing more sort of alongside the the actual uh, physical products in the future? Or is it is it yes. just something that as and when you feel you need to cover it? I think the physical is our, um, our core and our priority. Um, but, you know, as the last years have been the way the last years have been, mm. uh, most of my games have gone online. So I've had quite a lot of first-hand experience now of using Foundry and Roll20, the two that I mainly use. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, we've, we've got our products up on uh, Roll20 Marketplace and um, lots of our stuff is up on uh, drive for RPG. Mm-hmm. Um, I've also got a Patreon, which is kind of the company one, but it, it's just the maps that I I put out. Um, and that's usually whatever I'm sort of doing for my next game or mm-hmm. it, it gives me freedom to play around with much larger map sizes than we can do in the book format so you can do like a nice big sort of like 100 by 80 which you'd need yeah yeah <laughs> a giant size table for if you ever printed it out it's a, certainly a, an interesting way to go uh, the first quarter for you then is has obviously been very um full on as as the kickstarter is rolled out to retail what sort of plans do you have for the the rest of the year are there any major bits in the work or is it going to be a, a sort of a slow and steady for the time being as you sort of so recover? we've got a we've got a volume three for the um the fantasy big and giant coming out the big will be the first of those mm-hmm. um i'm not quite sure which quarter it is probably q3 i think for that we've also got the next uh, box of adventure which is coast of dread and that's slated for the same sort of time so later this year mm-hmm. um uh, what else have we got? We've got another um, two book set that doesn't have a release date or um, release plan as yet, which will be, uh, I'll try and get this the right way around Castles, Crypts, and Caverns. Ah. So it's where the dungeon is very, very generic. This will be slightly more on theme. So there'll be more um, assets and scenery on some of the pages and things right. um, for your big gothic castles and your um, cave systems and dusty tombs and things like that always interesting to uh to see especially when people people get too used to going down into a dungeon sometimes you have to make them ascend into a tower and then realize yeah. that if things go very badly wrong for them it's a long way down yeah but uh it's certainly fascinating to to hear what you've got planned anyway and hopefully we'll see it all come to fruition in the not too distant future if people are looking to uh keep tabs on what looks up to then uh is facebook the best way to keep look yeah, I mean, we're, we're fairly um, good, I think, at um, updating uh, Facebook and Twitter for the main sort of feeds. Mm-hmm. Well, we shall drop in Facebook, Twitter, and your Patreon link, because I didn't know you had one. It's very clever. Below, uh, if people are interested in finding out more of what Luke have got, um, then you should definitely check out the range of, well, everything but 
particularly that book and card set uh, for any budding or experienced GMs is is definitely one you should have on your shelf and there's no excuse not to. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you, Matt. Uh, hopefully we'll do this again soon. Thank you very much and hopefully actually uh, meet up in person at some point. Yeah. Okay, everyone, let us know what you think below. We're going to move on. Bye-bye. Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on.